to James and, and Patracy for, uh, for asking me to, uh, to speak to you this morning. Um, if I activate my screen, we should start to see the, the presentation and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll crack straight on. Perfect. So as, um, yep, all coming through okay, James? Brilliant, okay. Right, um, let's move this forward. So, things we're going to talk about this morning in the in the brief time, and this is a, a, a brief overview uh, of this subject. It's a massive subject, um, and we could spend at least most of today, if not into tomorrow, uh, talking about this. So, we're going to have a very quick uh, surface skim over the management of allergens through cleaning and disinfection. So, we're going to have a little look at the industry, talk a bit about what cleaning is, what cleaning can achieve, but also what it can't, um, what the clean looks like from the perspective of managing allergens. I'm just going to change my, better, right, my, uh, my screen a bit. Ooh, apologies. Went forward too quickly. I'm um, going to talk a little bit about cleaning and disinfection and what it can, what can, uh, can help there. And then any questions you've got, as uh, as Tracy said at the start, and as James just reiterated, please pop them in that chat box. More than happy to to answer the questions where we can. If it's something that's going to take a little bit longer than the time available, then you know more than happy to to come back to you um, separately uh, to give you the, uh, the the answers where possible on that. Um, and as uh, as both Tracy and James have said, there's a, a copy of the presentation will be emailed out along with a white paper we've created on cleaning without cleaning um, and where it fits in with, with allergen management. So I'm, I, I, I'm duty bound to tell you a little bit about my, uh, my, my, my company um, and the company that pays my, my bills. As James has said, I, I work with quite a few voluntary organisations, um, but this is also my, uh, my day job. Um, so Christine's Food Hygiene, if you haven't heard of us, are uh, an international group in applied chemistry. We are family owned, so we're quite unique in our sector. Um, we're owned by, uh, by Anne Bostoon in, uh, in Belgium. Our HQ is in Ghent, which I'm hoping to be able to get back to sometime soon, predominantly because the, the beer and the uh, chocolates are extremely good in Belgium. Um, privately owned, um, so a turnover of about 340 million euro in 2020. And we operate across five continents and 50 customers, uh, sorry, 50 countries and we produce the other second largest producer of proceeding acids in the world. And this is our core values. So we are a family of experts with a passion and deep commitment to uh, work with our customers to continuously improve their operations. And that's a, a mission statement that is, is ingrained into our, our DNA. Um, we're supplying cleaning, disinfection products, education and training, and we have a very good training brochure which is available off our website. Um, we service and support our customers with hygiene monitoring systems and provide equipment. And some of our customers, you can, you can see on the screen there, um, some uh, local companies um, and uh, some privately owned, some multinationals, um, and some like, uh, like Mondelez, uh, with sites uh, throughout the world. Um, and then others, Greg's are a particular favorite of mine, uh, as, it, as is it's shown by my expanding waistline, through the, uh, through the pandemic. Right, I've sung for my supper. Let's get on to the, uh, the, the, the interesting bit, the reason you all joined today. <coughs> Excuse me. So, food in the industry. A lot of the processing, manufacturing, retail, service sector can include some quite process, uh, complex processes and, and equipment when you start to, to break it down. Um, this equipment is often designed uh, with achieving a particular objective in mind, generally changing large pieces of food into, into small. Um, and that's often designed for efficiency of processing, uh, for engineering ease, sometimes hygienic design, not often. Um, I've spent many, many years, as, as James indicated at the start, over 30 years in, in food factories, and there's always one piece of equipment that we look at and go, how the heck are we going to clean that? Um, and it obviously hasn't been designed for, with, with hygiene in mind, and we have to find a way to ensure that we don't only control allergens, but also pathogens like listeria, salmonella, et cetera. 
We also find that cleaning isn't just a one-off activity. Um, it can take place throughout the production day um, with, a, with uh, the, the more detailed clean uh, taking place at the end of the, end of the production shift. And that's some of the equipment you may find. Um, we've, we've deliberately selected equipment from the processing industry uh, and you may find in food retail and food service. So things like in the bottom right of your screen as you're looking at it, um, flighted elevated conveyors, uh, evisceration equipment in the poultry industry, right the way through to just above it, a simple table. And you may think, yeah, table, it's fairly easy to clean. You'd be surprised. Um, sometimes they can cause untold problems um, and unexpected problems. As you then go to refrigerated display cabinets, ovens, band saws, Y scales, and even things like hand um, wash stations can, can cause a problem. Um, we're all much more washing our hands now, um, much more frequently over the past um, 14, 15 months. And I, I don't see that changing, um, in, at least in the, the foreseeable future, while uh, a little, uh, little SARS-CoV-2 friend is, is still with us. So the equipment can be relatively simple, right way through to, to highly complex. And anybody who's tried to strip down a bandsaw um, or try to strip down a meat slicer, um, as is in the bottom left-hand side there, with its variable uh, thickness uh, controls, will find will attest to the fact that it can you can get a lot of trap areas. So, allergen control and cleaning. Right. First thing you need to do when you're looking at any piece of equipment and you want to clean it, whether to be fair, it's for allergens or whether it's for um, listeria control or species control. Um, even if you're producing a, a vegetarian product after a meat product, any form of, of cleaning, um, you need to consider certain factors because the cleanability of that surface really does play a big part, um, as will the form of the allergen. So to give an example, if you take, uh, let's pick an allergen, let's, let's pick milk. Uh, so let's start with milk in a solid form. So a uh, pat of butter, for example. If you drop that onto a surface, by and large, it will pretty much sit there. It won't do a great deal. It will just sit there and eventually it will melt and liquefy. But for, for the short term, it's just going to sit there as a lump. If you take milk as a liquid and pour it onto a surface, it will flow across that surface and contaminate other points. If you take milk as a powder, you open the powder and, and you get a poof and you get a puff and a little cloud um, and you end up with, with milk powder all over the place. So the form of the allergen has a real effect on what cleaning you can achieve and how your controls will work. The porosity, the texture of the surface is important. The cleaning method that you can use, which we're gonna look at a little bit more and the materials of construction so if you start with the easiest to decontaminate of anything, whether it's allergens, micro, physical, chemical contaminants, is stainless steel. Good grade, 316, 304 grade stainless is, is pretty easy to clean. Um, it's resilient to most chemicals. It's resilient to most chemical uh, cleaning methods and, and uh, green pads or, or brushes. A little bit more difficult, things like aluminium, softer metals. If you hit them with certain chemicals, um, you start to degrade the surface, which leads to delamination of aluminium, and you end up with a, with a, a porous surface and a surface where you end up with, with contaminants building up. Hard plastic can be quite easily scored. So you end up with ridges and, and crevices where um, allergens can, can accumulate. Soft plastic and rubber, because it's soft, you can get crevices, you can get indentation. Um, the same with rubber seals, you can get fragments of, of allergenic proteins stuck behind them. And then right at the bottom of the, 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 the chart there, um, most difficult to clean, anything made of cloth and anything made of wood. So anything porous um, that can be quite a challenge to, to clean. Um, and we often see not so much wood, but certainly cloth in some bakeries um, where they may be handling things like sesame seeds. Um, and they may have cloth belts, particularly in provers, um, and in certain parts of the equipment where they, they need the, the surface conveying the food to clean. And that can be a challenge, um, particularly for sesame seeds, because the little buggers stick everywhere. They tend to become electrostatically charged. 
Um, and I've, I've witnessed people pushing trolleys across bakery floors with uh, sesame seeds clinging to the sides and spreading all over the factory. So you need to think about the cleanability of the surfaces and, and what you're trying to achieve. There's quite a bit of work published in this area. Um, on the left hand side of the screen as, as you're looking at it, there's a guideline 59 from Camden BRI on validation of cleaning to remove allergens. And it's frightening to think that that was produced first in 2009. Um, so it's probably due for a, a bit of a, an update. It was updated a short while ago. Um, so it's part of the team that, that wrote it and then uh, updated it. Um, but it's, uh, it's probably due for a, a read. I don't know about you guys, but 2009 doesn't actually feel that long ago, um, but 12 years is, is quite a while. So um, yeah, it's a interesting one. Um, on the right hand side of your screen is the eHedge guidelines, the European Hygienic Engineering Design Group, and they produced a doc very good document and a very good set of documents on hygienic design principles. So how equipment should be designed, constructed and modified to reduce the risk of um, contaminant uh, accumulation. Um, and that's very, very good. And then in the middle there, you've got a very good book on food allergy our methods of detection and clinical studies. And we'll look a little bit in detection later. Not a great deal because we don't have time, but certainly we'll take a, a surface skim over, um, over detection methods. So cleaning methods. We always, one of the main questions we get asked, what's the latest thing in cleaning? And, and I'm convinced sometimes that um, people think that we're hanging on to cleaning methods and no mine, my precious mine. We're not. If there's something new, trust me, we'll tell you because um, we want people using new methods. But cleaning methods haven't really changed a huge amount in certainly the time I've been in, in industry. If you give somebody a bucket and a brush or a green pad or a disposable wipe and say, go clean it, pretty much anything can be cleaned that way. It will take you a long time. Um, it can be quite complex. Um, it can take a, an army of people. But certainly manual cleaning using that type of technology is, is relatively straightforward. Um, and can be quite, uh, quite readily achieved. If you've got large areas to clean, so you know, manual cleaning, if you're in a, a kitchen or if you're in a food service area, you're probably gonna manually clean it or put it through an automatic dishwash unit. Um, if you're into industry, then we start looking for large areas at foam or gel cleaning. Um, and that's the, if my cursor shows up, that's the, the foam gun here. Um, you may uh, may use on your on your patio uh, for jet washing the patio at that time of year again. Um, or if you go to a, uh, one of the car wash stations, uh, you may find they, they you, your car gets attacked with with uh, foam guns, um, and that's a great way of applying detergent to a large surface area in a relatively short space of time. We have automated systems. We'll look at CIP in a few moments. So things like dairies, ready meals, beverage operations, will have CIP sets, um, tray washes. And many of you even in food service will have a form of a tray wash, um, maybe a Hobart or a similar type unit where you load everything onto a rack, push it in, pull the lid down, press the button and away it goes. It rinses, it cleans with detergent, it rinses again with hot water, and then you pull the tray out the other side um, and take off your, your clean crockery and um, utensils and knives and forks and spoons and, and your mugs, etc. So tray washes are pretty much a, a, a large industrial version of that where you've got multiple chambers and you may feed three, four, five thousand trays a day through that to get them clean. Obviously doing that manually would take an army of people. So automation is, is good. Similar thing for, for rack washes for, for large trays. And one of the things we've started to see a lot more coming through into industry are robotic cleaning. Um, and they are getting there. Um, robotics is, is getting sort of more used in, in the food industry, but certainly automated robotic cleaning systems are starting to come through for things like sandwich manufacturing. Um, uh, and yeah, as long as it's been well designed and well maintained, it's good. But you have to watch where the robot cleans because the rest of it needs to be cleaned as well. And that may involve manual cleaning or, or foam or gel cleaning. So manual cleaning, some key factors you need to think about are on screen there. Diligence of the operative and the attention to detail. 
you know, if somebody is distracted, if somebody's busy talking to their mate about the football last night um, or about what's going on with a certain viral pandemic, then their attention may be, may be distracted. Um, their diligence, their attention to detail is critical um, to both allergens and micro removal. Making sure they've got the right cleaning equipment. So, you know, have they got a good brush or are half the bristles missing? Uh, have they got the right type of pad? Have they got the right type of cloth? Is it a clean cloth? Have they got the right detergent? Is it the right type? Is it the right concentration? If it needs temperature to work, is it the right temperature? One of the key things we find with manual cleaning is, is incorrect concentrations of temperature, either too weak or sometimes too strong, and that can present a health and safety hazard to the individual operative too. The time to clean. You know, cleaning is often done in some scenarios at the end of the shift by the production people, and they're tired, they've had a long day, they want to go home. You know, things can be missed, back to diligence and attention to detail. And yes, diligence is in there twice, as you can see. And also the design of the equipment. So if the equipment isn't designed to be effectively cleaned and disinfected, then it can be a challenge to actually clean it. You can have recesses, you can have cavities, you can have debris that, that accumulates and builds up. For foam cleaning, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's a great way of spreading detergent over a large area in a short space of time. So again, diligence and attention to detail are there, making sure you get an effective coverage, again, with the correct concentration of that detergent. And we can use slightly stronger detergents in these scenarios because we're firing the detergent away from ourselves. And that works very, very well. But it still needs some manual agitation. Remember the sinner's circle. We need agitation, we need manual energy, we need time, we need temperature, and we need chemical energy in order to clean effectively. Then needs to be thoroughly rinsed, and that's as much to get rid of the debris as to get rid of the um, contaminants, because a lot of these detergents will either take the contaminant and put it into a suspension, or will break the fats and oils down, um, which can potentially release the proteins. Um, which can then cause, go on to cause further contamination. So we need to make sure we thoroughly rinse our detergents away and then visually inspect to see if we've got any debris remaining. I mentioned tray wash or rack washers. These are for automatic cleaning of, of trays and other items. And the concern can sometimes be carry over uh, from one uh, product to another. Proper validation that we'll look at shortly an operation will reduce that risk um, and the volumes of these tanks can be anywhere up to 200 litres so a little bit of allergen dropping into for example the pre-rinse um, will, will not cause a problem but if you look at this diagram you often find that the wearing is this way so you never wear the other way so you're coming from an area of low concentration that liquid in rinse will flow into detergent detergent into pre-rinse pre-rinse to drain so that way you've got a flow out that way so any contaminants that do build up here will be diluted down as they go through. CIP sets, as I mentioned earlier, used extensively in dairy, brewing, beverage, and ready meals. Again, concern of carryover from one product to the other, but because a lot of these systems uh, save and reuse the detergent solution, effective pre-rinses are critical because you don't want a lot of debris going back into your detergent tank. You wanna get rid of as much debris as possible beforehand and then give the detergent a fighting chance to remove the, the final residues. But again, proper validation, proper operation will reduce that, that risk. And the CIP tends to follow a stage of pre-rinse, detergent clean, rinse, and then disinfectant stage. So again, you've got those multiple rinse and liquid stages, which will help to reduce the risk of carryover of egg or peanut protein, for example, from one product to another, providing you've properly validated and assessed your CIP operation and you don't have dead legs. So that's why I'm talking a total loss system where all the liquid is lost. Here you're looking at a recovery system where detergent will circulate through, be pumped back and you'll have some detergent that comes back through the system and is recovered. This is where the pre-rinse becomes critical to make sure that you don't have too much debris building up in, in here. Plus, because these are quite high uh, detergent strengths in the detergent tank, if you've got any fats and oils in there with the agitation, 
you'll end up with a lot of foaming here, which can give you operational difficulties. I've mentioned detergent several times. There are three flavors of detergent. When I say flavors, I wouldn't taste them, but uh, certainly there, there are three types. Um, there's the neutral, um, which are often the um, uh, work by uh, emulsification of fats and oils. So these are things like you could have washing up liquids. Really suitable for manual cleaning because they're relatively safe for um, food, ha food handlers to, to touch, uh, so to use. Um, you can get some reactions, so gloves are always appropriate, um, but manual cleaning um, is great for emulsifying the fats and oils, and, and we do that with, with washing up liquids, so fairy liquid, fantastic manual de uh, neutral detergent. We may build a biocide into that, we do quite often, in order to just deal with any residual uh, bacteria that are there, but um, as we'll see in a moment, uh, we'll talk about disinfectants and biocides and their effects on, on allergens. The alkaline detergents work by a process called saponification, um, which is quite literally making soap from fats and oils. So it's converting the fat and oil into a, into a soap. Um, and if you've ever spilt any chemical onto your hands and felt it go a bit, a bit slimy, a bit soapy, um, that's actually making soap from your skin. Um, so that's the process called saponification. Um, we can apply those manually. We tend to keep those away from optives where possible. Um, and that tend to apply those either by foam or in, in solution as a, as a recirculation. So you need to you know, look what you're doing with, with those products. When it's in particularly aggressive formulations, we may refer to that as caustic. Um, and traditionally that's used in, in CIP, tray and rack washing. And you may come across that in some common products in um, oven cleaning, for example. So Mr. Muscle type sprays are, are up into the caustic, so pH 13, 14 range. And re always, always read the instructions on chemicals. You know, a chemical doesn't have a brain. If you don't use yours, it will interact with you. The whole purpose of a chemical is to interact with the substrate and change it in some way. Um, and it can cause damage. For acids, they're not really that brilliant at cleaning, but they are very good at uh, mineral scale removal and protein removal. So if you live in a hard water area, you may often find yourself having to um, descale, uh, descale equipment, descale a kettle, uh, for example, where you get a, a mineral scale calcium carbonate buildup. But where you get that sort of layer building up, that can be a trap point for allergenic proteins as well. Um, but acids are not particularly good cleaners. Um, the alkalis and neutrals tend to be. <laughs> so common problems and how to avoid them. Some common problems we come across in all sorts of equipment. Doesn't matter whether we're talking a, um, a, a, a retail um, sort of snack van on the side and a lay bar on the side of the road or a multinational food factory. We see common cleaning problems throughout every range of the food industry. Track points, that's number one. Joints, conveyors, hard to reach areas. One of our com common questions when we go into a new factory is, right, talk to the hygiene team. Where can't you get to? Where's difficult to access? Because that's where we need to start looking at the, at the, the track points and the possible buildup of, of debris. Insufficient time and insufficient training. So people who haven't got enough time to clean properly, it needs to be quickly turned around. Um, they want to get home. They want to get onto the next, next cover. And it's a case of you need time to clean. You've got to have that time and you've got to have the right level of training and the right attention to detail. If you don't know what you're doing and you're not bothered about doing it, then your clean will be ineffective and food contamination will occur. Whether it's allergens or whether it's micro, you will get some form of, of uh, contamination coming through. <coughs> Excuse me. And the use of the wrong equipment or the wrong chemical. So just grabbing any old brush or just grabbing any old chemical because it's, it, it's the one that was available. So the cleaning regime needs to be effectively designed and think back to the very start, the cleanability of the surface, the material of the surface, the debris that you're trying to remove, all of it needs to be, uh, to be effectively assessed. If you are looking to achieve an effective allergen clean, unsurprisingly, engineer out the trap points. If you've got trap point areas um, which are, are causing uh, residue to build up, 
find a way to engineer them out. You know, if it's a case of filling it or replacing it or covering it, um, you know, work with the, the, the food safety experts to ensure that you actually engineer out those track points. Allow sufficient time and provide sufficient training to your staff to ensure that they're able to carry out the clean effectively and diligently. And if you are bringing new equipment in, look at it, look at it with a cleaner's eyes, look at it to think to yourself, if I had to clean that, where would be the difficult areas? How would I do it? Too much equipment we see coming into industry that is designed for production or maintenance purposes. Little thought is given sometimes to hygiene. So you know, look at that equipment and evaluate it. Where, where are the difficulty areas? Where's the instructions? Talk to the team, you know, encourage attention to detail, um, provide dedicated equipment and access to chemicals and ensure that the hygiene equipment itself is clean following use. Many people will uh, say, right, well, for allergens, we're gonna have a, a dedicated color, okay? Dedicated equipment, superb, brilliant, fantastic. Do you clean it? Well, no, it's only used for allergens. Yeah, but what happens is over time, a brush or a sweeper, uh, a scraper um, or a piece of cleaning equipment may itself become an accumulant of, of contaminants. Remember, with when we're talking about allergens, we're not talking about something that is alive. We're talking about a protein strand. So you can't kill it. And if you get milk protein or egg protein or peanut protein building up in the recesses in a brush or a squeegee or a scraper, it will stay there. And if you continue using it without cleaning it, it will continue to build up. And at some point it's going to fall out and sods or is it will fall out and end up in something where it shouldn't. And that's when your consumer is then placed at risk. So make sure that hygiene equipment is itself cleaned following use. Just because you're using it to carry out a clean doesn't mean the equipment intrinsically of itself is then clean. It needs to be effectively cleaned um, you know, following its use to make sure you don't uh, end up causing inadvertent contamination. And check, check, inspect and test. And we'll talk about testing very shortly, but checking can be as simple as visual. Just have a look, is the surface visually clean? If it's not visually clean, do it again, because it's likely you're gonna have contaminant, cro contaminant cross contact. In terms of testing, Sorry, I've referred to a, a, a webinar there earlier on testing when I, I used this presentation originally for, for the anaphylaxis campaign. So I'm going to talk a little more about testing now, simply because you haven't got that webinar to, uh, to refer to. Apologies to, uh, to James and Tracy there. Um, we have different types of tests that we can use. Um, on the left of the screen, the validation type tests are laboratory based, ELISA testing. We are using PCR testing for allergens, although not as much. Um, and nowadays we, we are far more familiar with PCR testing, thanks to, a, a, again, a little viral friend. Um, we're also quite familiar now with lateral flow tests, and I'm sure many people on this call, um, myself included, have, have done lateral flow tests. Um, I did one yesterday because um, I knew I was coming to our offices today um, for, for SARS-CoV-2 um, to make sure I was, I was clear before I came. Um, but you can also get them for, for allergens. Um, previous years, we've described these as a bit like home pregnancy test kits, similar sort of technology, but we're looking for proteins. Um, so they can either come as a, as a lateral flow or as a flow through. And again, if you can just make out on there, you've got a, a nut detected of two lines and a positive is three lines or one line. <clears throat> so a bit like the, the if you've done a SARS-CoV-2 one recently, you, that's a two line test where you get a control and a, and, a, and a test line. So if you get what you're looking for is one line of control to show that you're, you're not infected at that point. We have similar ones for those for, for allergens, not for the, all the allergens, hasten to add. Um, some are proving quite difficult to develop those rap, rapid lateral flow tests, um, but some are, are more readily available than others. Um, and there's more details on, the, uh, on, on our website and also in the, in the white paper of the various suppliers of, of those tests. 
But we do have to be careful. As I say, we are using a little bit of, of DNA PCR testing for allergens, but we do have to be very careful because we're not looking for the right reactive protein. Um, so if you've got, for example, a product that contains beef um, and you're concerned about milk protein, then DNA analysis will not help you. It also won't tell you the difference between chicken and egg, same DNA. So we need to be a little bit careful. Just because we've got the DNA present doesn't necessarily mean we've got the allergenic reactive protein. Some people may use uh, a technology called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It's a very widely used um, and is an excellent non-specific hygiene monitoring system. And the, the, the little graphic there um, of a firefly is, is intentional because it's the same biochemical mechanism that your firefly uses to, to generate its, um, its, uh, it, it, its glow. Um, and for, for those of my, uh, my youngest daughter's generation, um, when Ray died in The Princess and the Frog, it was up there for those oldies who are amongst us with, uh, with Bambi's mum dying. So, yeah, I decided to use that cartoon because if you can't take a joke, we shouldn't have joined. So, you know, we tend to keep it, keep it light and bouncy. Thing is with ATP, it's of little use in allergen management. As I mentioned earlier, allergenic proteins aren't alive. So a low level of ATP does not necessarily equate to a low level of protein, only low levels of living or recently deceased cells. Now, if you get, if you are using ATP or you do use ATP um, and you, you get a high level on your ATP before you release the equipment, then you've probably got protein there. You've probably got debris there. But as I say, if you get a low level, doesn't necessarily mean that you've got low protein levels. And I've seen this practically myself um, when I've had um, tests on equipment, particularly things like egg and egg protein, we can get a low level of ATP and a, and a massive hit on, on egg protein levels on, on surfaces. Egg and milk proteins tend to be the stickiest. So egg will stick to stainless steel very, very easily. Um, so it takes some, some real um, detailed cleaning and, and diligent cleaning in order to effectively remove it. So that's one to, to watch out for. Finally, before we, uh, we go too much further, let's talk about disinfectants. So the role that disinfectants play in managing allergens. We all are very familiar with bar size and disinfectants now, and we're throwing disinfectants around with gay abandon in our, in our homes and in our premises and onto our hands um, to control our, our little viral friend. In the world of allergen management, they have one very key crucial role to play, nothing. Disinfectants will have absolutely no material effect on an allergen. And that's simply because, and there is, I'm not going to apologize for reiterating and repeating this several times during this presentation, allergens are simple protein strands. They are not alive, so you cannot kill them. So a disinfectant is a product, with chemical product, which will inactivate and kill bacteria. Okay, so it will kill things. However, as allergens to protein strands, they cannot be killed. That flow of liquid may help you to displace some allergens from a food contact surface, but it will not materially affect any allergens remaining. So the, the, the conclusion, allergen cross-contamination from product to product, from food service to food service, from cover to cover, is about the clean. Okay, you can't take shortcuts. You've got to clean effectively in order to remove the debris. Just blow, you know, quick rinse, wipe over, blowing disinfectant on. Yeah, you'll probably take out the listeria and the salmonella, but you won't take, you won't displace your allergens. So allergen cross-contamination is all about the clean. So to reiterate, it's about the clean in totality. It's about the time, it's about the diligence, it's about your detergent, and it's about your equipment design. And as, uh, as James and Tracy said at the start of this, uh, a white paper on management of allergens through cleaning will be distributed later. Um, and as James, me James mentioned, I sit on the corporate panel of the Anaphylaxis Campaign, which is an excellent charity for allergen management. If you're not members, I'd heartily encourage you to, to join. That's both as a, as a corporate member, somebody who lives and breathes allergens, and also as a member of the board of trustees for that, that charity. And it is purely funded through charity and does a huge amount of work 
and publishes a lot of really useful information on, on allergens and allergen management. So I'd encourage you to, to visit their, their website um, to, uh, to, to pick up more information on that. And at that point, James and Tracy, I think we've got about 20 minutes for <laughs> questions. That's Thank you, Peter. Okay, thanks, Peter. That was excellent. Uh, a very practical run through, uh, I suppose, confirming really the, the, I suppose, the concentration that you need to have to get the, the whole cleaning and disinfection process right. And the difference between allergens and uh, other uh, bacterial contaminants as well. I mean, that's one of the things that I um, you know, at my workshops, I iterate is the difference between allergens and bacteria. You, you, they're not the same. Allergens, as you said, they're proteins. They'll stick to everything. And one of the one of the examples I give is that is the windscreen maybe around autumn, an autumn evening, when you have all these kind of flies crashing into your windscreen as you're driving along and they cling in. Um, you know, that's protein. It's sticky. It's very hard to get off the windscreen. You really have to have to put elbow grease into 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 getting off the windscreen. Just a quick question, Peter. You know, for for I'm thinking of the maybe the the seaside cafe where you know one person operation and they've a, a galley kitchen, <laughs> you know, a tiny galley kitchen out the back, and they've got to do everything. You know, one one person operation, and um, they've got to control their allergens as well. Yep. Uh, by law, and. Uh, you know what, what's the and they've got to you know they've got they've got to do the bills they've got to you know maybe look after the staff they've got to do the hygiene they've got to think about the menus they've got and everything in between uh time generally isn't on uh, you mentioned it in your in your presentation time is one of is one of the factors uh and and they they really do want to accommodate you know especially for the most popular choice here would probably be gluten-free choices you know because a lot of people ask for gluten-free food or you know food that doesn't contain cereals containing gluten to be technical about um what's the best course of action that that person can take i mean they've you know they'd have that maybe the stainless steel draining board chopping boards possibly plastic or wooden and uh, they use the same utensils for everything they can't afford to have a dedicated set of utensils what what do they do what do they what do they watch what, what do they have to watch for which allergens are the bad ones <laughs> the Allergen that is of concern to that consumer is the worst one to that consumer. So there's no particular ranking in terms of, um, you know, well, people think of nuts and peanuts as the most serious. That's because they're the most likely to cause um, anaphylaxis. anaphylaxis. However, milk is, is the second largest cause of fatal anaphylaxis reactions across the UK and Ireland. Um, there are more people in Northern Europe that are allergic to apple than any other single food source. Right. And it's linked to birch pollen. Um, and, and we're coming into the time of year where, where um, sort of hay fever starts to kick in. So the individual, the individual person's unique allergenic characteristic profile will very much determine what's important to them. That means that as a food business operator, you can't say, well, this allergen is number one, that's category two, that's category three. Everyone's important. So it's having a simple, and please, folks, keep it simple. One of the things we do in, in hygiene is complicate the hell out of a simple operation and then wonder why it goes wrong. Keep it simple. It's easy to, to then become a habit. And in the scenario you've described there where you've got um, shared and common equipment, fortunately, in that type of scenario, you haven't got particularly complex bits of kit. So you haven't got conveyors, you haven't got um, slicers, you've probably got, as you described, a chopping board, a stainless steel contact surface and a knife. Great. That's easy to wash. So make sure you've got plenty of, of space for washing up. And it is a simple thing of a good, good manual detergent in the sink, get some hot water in there if you can, wash it, rinse it, Wipe it dry, preferably with disposable paper towel. That will be better. If not, then with a clean, clean, clean tea cloth. Yeah. Um, and then you'll, you will have removed it. But look very carefully at, and inspect your equipment. If there's nicks, if there's defects, if there's ridges, if there's crevices, that can be areas where things can build up. So if you're using a chopping board, 
use something that is is as resilient to cuts as possible you know don't use wood for example yeah you know, hard plastic is good but look inspect it on a daily basis look and see if it's if it's scored at the end of each of each day when you do take your stuff home stick it to the dishwasher yeah. make sure you give it some a really good clean it is about in that scenario i'm afraid even more than than many other scenarios the diligence and the time and the effort that's put in to make sure that the, the clean is done effectively yeah and 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 even for something like maybe a, a greasy pan or a, or a wok w would you recommend maybe just a bit of elbow grease and detergent and then the dishwasher af after that just to be to be sure El yeah I, I was i was looking at a cleaning task last week um and i found the magic ingredient that we needed to add to the green pad and the and the, the detergent was elbow grease yeah <laughs> and a bit of elbow grease it came up beautifully yeah spray the chemical on and go go on then get on with it really wasn't doing it um so that is something where you've got to put the time the effort and the diligence in to prevent that cross contact and unfortunately as as we've seen training awareness is is critical um there was a report last week um about uh, mark carey who unfortunately lost his life um uh, for a burger that had been marinated in buttermilk mm. he'd asked his server his server didn't check the message didn't get through to the kitchen and unfortunately mark lost his life mm. and we do see um only well i say only a dozen to 14 fatalities per year across the uk that's from, right from allergen you know that we know of from that reaction that's too many yeah they're all, right. they're all generally preventable so it is about the diligence it is about the effective cleaning yeah and and just following on from that what do you think is the best product for cleaning kitchen service and sink if you were to if you were to go in and, and say right okay for us here's your kitchen service and sink how would you clean it get the allergens off <sighs> Again, you've got to look at what allergens you're dealing with, what food product you're dealing with. So if you're dealing with a small um, baker shop where everything needs to be kept dry, um, James, you and I are of a similar generation where we know that if you mix flour and water together, you get glue. Mm -hmm. so, you know, a lot of bakeries want to have a dry wash or dry clean. And it is about removing as much of that debris first as you can. So it's in that sort of scenario, an old dustpan and brush. Yeah. They'll vacuum it up, sweep the debris off, use a neutral detergent to remove any fats and proteins that may be left. You know, dry cleaning is a bit of a misnomer. Um, we're starting to use the phrase controlled wet more than dry cleaning. And that might be disposable, um, disposable cloths. That may be a, a trigger spray with a neutral detergent in and a blue paper towel. So squirt on the surface, wipe over, as is shown over my shoulder there, that way. You know, so just a, a spray and a wipe over, or it may be um, impregnated wipes. You know, so dry clean the surface, wipe over. If you're dealing with a, um, uh, so for example, uh, you've just cut up some some raw uh, raw chicken, or you've just cut up, you know, you've been handling some marinades on a surface. You know, dry cleaning isn't going to work. So that's where hot water and um, sort of solution will will work very well. Um, so that's where your, your, your sink comes in. Or if you've got access to a dishwasher, an automatic washing kit, even better. Yeah. You know, because then, although the, the elapsed time for the clean takes longer, the effectiveness, the temperature, and the jets of water, providing you don't overload it. Yeah. You know, if you, if you end up with shadow, what we call shadow areas, where the detergent and the, and the water streams don't impact, then you're not going to get it clean. Yeah. So it's about thinking very rationally and logically about the cleaning process as i say it's not complicated 99.9 .9 of cleaning is common sense yeah. it's that 0.1 percent that is the science yeah and, and we have a question here how often to empty the rinse in a dishwasher i presume you know because you, you can get a half hour program or you can get a three hour program so mm -hmm. i presume again that's how you know what are you putting in there isn't that right and it depends on sequencing as well, because it depends on your solution. I mean, yes, you get you do get a lot of these dishwashers where you end up with a, with a solution in the bottom that gets reused time after time. Um, from my experience, most of those use fresh water supply for the final rinse, not the detergent solution. And just as I showed with the tray wash, if you get a little bit of allergen buildup in the detergent, it's not necessarily the end of the world. 
because although that will get redeposited onto other um, onto other solution onto other uh, contact mm -hmm. surfaces, the freshwater rinse will help to dislodge anything that's there. But if you've got something that is particularly contaminated, um, say it's got a lot of egg protein on, or it's got a lot of milk on the surface, then a good pre-clean to start with will help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, we have another question here actually. Um, so uh, I, I think we, we, we've just mentioned that, that nothing, especially for difficult um, utensils like a greasy pan, I mean, you're, you're really talking about giving it a blast with detergent, hot water and elbow grease, and then maybe putting into a dishwasher after that. Is, is that right? Or will, will the first step be okay? Especially if you're, if you're in a hurry, you, you don't have the time to put it into a dishwasher, clean it, on, clean it with hot water, elbow grease and detergent just to get the, the residue off. Yeah. yeah. And what about yeah. the likes of, uh, of ovens and pizza ovens that are difficult, difficult to clean? Um, <clears throat> how, how, can you, how can they manage, manage those? Uh, with, pizza, with things like pizza ovens, if you've got debris dropping off, which you, you may well have, it's about the way you stack it. And it's also dry scraping. Yeah. Yeah, remove, yeah removing the, the, anything that, that does drop off promptly. Um, so the, which you may be doing as well, because if you're, if you're um, concerned with, with uh, vegetarian pizzas, um, as well as meat containing pizzas, you want to make sure you don't end up with um, meat, meat protein cross contact as well. And a lot of the things for vegetarian um, cross, contact, cross contact work for allergens as well, because we are talking at the end of the day of proteins. Mm, you know, it's yeah. meat proteins versus vegetable proteins, it's allergenic proteins versus non allergenic. Although if you look hard enough, you'll find somebody who reacts to just about everything. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I think it's fair to say too, Peter, that, I mean, if you're talking about a, a pizza oven and, you know, it's either going to be a, glu a dedicated gluten-free pizza oven or, or not, you know, it would be just impossible to control gluten, you know, in the likes of a pizza oven, isn't that right? But certainly, if you're talking gluten, talking pizzas, then to, you, you'd, be, you'd need to look at dedicated ovens. Yeah, um, absolutely. Because you, you've got, you've got you know, if you're talking about, for example, shellfish, so prawns, on a on a pizza, um, you know that that they're relatively easy to control because if they drop off, you pick them up and give it a wipe. Um, but you also notice if they dropped off. Whereas if you've got a gluten and you're trying to use a gluten surface for a non handling non gluten equipment, you've got to make sure that level of clean is good in between. Because if you think how a pizza sits on a surface, you've got a large surface area of contact, you've got a large area for contamination. It comes back to what we were saying right at the start about the cleanability. Think about what your contact points are. Yeah, exactly. And and you mentioned a bakery there. Um, do you have any recommendations for floor cleaning in a bakery? Something that would break down what you call you know the, the water for our gloop. <laughs> I think it's called the gloop. Um, yeah, I mean it, it, you'll be looking there at a, a good alkaline detergent um, that will help to saponify the, the, the fats and oils. Um, in terms of allergen cross contact onto equipment, onto product, I would hope the product wouldn't be impacting the floor and then going back onto the surface. So floor uh, to, to, to product cross contamination, you've got to look very carefully at your fomite or secondary vehicle contact routes. Because if you've got a transfer route from the floor to the surface, you've got some form of, of breakdown of, of good hygienic practices and good manufacturing practices. So a good um, alkaline detergent will help to remove that. And you, we generally find that bakeries do at least once a week um, good deep foam cleaning. Yeah. During the week, they'll do a, a general, as I said earlier, sweep over and, and control wet, minimize water clean. One of the weekends, they'll open up, they'll foam everything down, get it all back to a good standard and then carry on for the next week. Yeah. Uh, we have another question here. Would you recommend general purpose protein swabs for validation of cleaning for allergens such as 3M clean trace surface protein plus swabs as opposed to specific allergen testing for each allergen? This is, this is, a, this is an ongoing headache. I mean, how, how do you, especially in yeah, catering, I mean, how, how are you going to do it? Like, you know. The, the, I won't necessarily make a comment on any specific um, test technologies. I do know the 3M tests very well. Um, I know a lot of people at 3M very well, and they are excellent non-specific tests. The key, the key you've got to watch out for is, let's take the, let's go back to our pizza example. So let's use our pizza example with, with prawns on it. If you're making pizzas with prawns, 
how are you going to tell if the proteins you're detecting are from the gluten, from the uh, tomatoes, uh, from the cheese, or from the prawns? Mm. So the problem with a non-specific test is in its name. It's not specific for the protein you're looking for. So if you're concerned about a specific protein, so for example, in a sandwich factory, unless they make gluten-free sandwiches, we don't recommend control of gluten. There's no point. It's in everything. We very rarely control dairy proteins because, again, there's a layer of dairy spread on every sandwich. So you then control by exception. So you control by the prawns or for the shrimps or you control for the egg, um, although a lot of sandwiches have mayonnaise on, so that one's dealt with as well. So you look at the you look at the process, and rather than say, right, let's control every allergen we've got, let's look at what allergens are unique to individual products. If we've got some commonality, we can take those away. Yeah. Let's focus on the ones we've got. So non-specific testing, whether it's non-specific protein tests, whether it's ATP, um, whether it's it's colorimetric sprays like Fresh Check, which change color when there's when there's debris or bacteria present. That's great for general hygiene control. If we're talking very specifics, then you need to look at a specific test method to make sure yet yeah, we have controlled that particular element. A good analogy in microbiological terms would be to say, well, you know, my concern, my concern is listeria, listeria monocytogenes, because I produce ready to eat foods. Fantastic. But I'll just check by looking for the general microbiological flora. So do a TVC. Well, no, you'd go on and look for specific listeria and even drill down to the species because it's that, you're, it's that item you're specifically concerned with. Mm. Yeah. Can you recommend the best way to train staff on cleaning so they know how to clean properly? Does it need to be training on the job? Yes. Okay. Well, that answers so, that. <laughs> you, you, can try, you can train the basic science behind it um, via this sort of training via face-to-face, -face, via learning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are some very, very good um, allergen awareness, um, free e-learning courses. Uh, the Food Standards Agency in the UK does one that's freely available. Um, and the anaphylaxis campaign have an allergy wise, uh, which gives you the basic awareness and understanding of, of the risk of allergens to consumers. In terms of the actual training, it needs to be specific to your particular environment because your equipment, your people, your mechanism, your process is unique to yourselves. Hmm. And, and just go back to the the, the, the cleaning um, um, point you were making earlier. Uh, when you, if you're cleaning a wok or a pan, for instance, with a cloth or, or, or a scrubber, um, does the fact that you're using a cleaning product not only clean the pan, but would it clean the scrubber as well? You said that the scrubber ultimately could be a source of allergen over time, but you, you know, w w should give it a good rinse and with the detergent as well, would that work? Yes. I mean, if you if you think about the, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure about you guys. I'm, I don't use this cloth. I have a, a, these little sponge pads with the little green bit on the, on the other side. Yeah, another one. What you need to do is after, after a few days of using that, take a look at the side, take a look at the green side, because you'll see there is debris built up there. You'll see that the, the green bit has started to wear off. So the, the the equipment you need you use, as I say, has to be cleaned itself. If you don't clean it, you will get some potential cross contact and some cross um, transfer of, of proteins. And can the can the allergens stick to your gloves and hands while you're while you're cleaning? I mean, I, I presume that there's a possibility they could. Or would the, would the detergent remove yeah. it from those two? It should remove it from those two. It, it should, um, but it is worth it is worth looking at just to make sure that. Um, that what you, you that your hands are clean, that your gloves are clean, and if you've just cleaned a particularly contaminated piece of equipment and you've got debris on your gloves or on your hands, you should go and wash them, yeah. because which you're going to pass you do anyway. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be passing that onto the clean surface. Yeah. yeah. So the very fact of of, of, of the, you've got debris, you can see on hands, as I said earlier, visual inspection. Can I see it? Yes, I can. Wash my hands. Right, clean. Off I go. Uh, another question with regard to a bakery, uh, what's the best way of washing a conveyor with catch points in, a, in the dry cleaning environment of, of such as a bakery? <laughs> hmm. Without seeing the specific equipment, it's difficult to give a generalized answer. Um, it is about looking at the kit, as I was saying earlier. It's about, can you brush it? 
Can you get an explosion-proof vacuum to vacuum from the from the catch points and the trap points? Can you engineer them out? You don't you don't always have to live with catch points. You know, there is often if you get a, an engineering um, expertise involved, they can look and they go, well, actually, if we put a block in here, it will block that gap. Yeah. But then make sure that the block and the gap that's put in doesn't give you a further problem by causing you a recess. Yeah. So it's about risk assessing and looking very carefully at that piece of equipment you're working with and making sure that, that you've evaluated it properly. Yeah. And, and, and we have other question here. So it, it's, it's rather long, but it's, it's quite interesting. Um, when approving a supplier, uh, this person's supplier have said that they have allergen controls in place and mm -hmm. they've sent external lab analysis validating their cleaning and allergen cross-contamination controls. Um, but they've only sent results for one allergen, in this particular instance, celery, uh, where this was not present in a broccoli product. But can this be used then to approve the absence of other allergens too? Uh, such as if they can eliminate celery, for instance, cross-contamination, can you take it in that they, they're competent enough to control other allergens like shrimp and other things as well? <laughs> I've got a coin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It means that the, they have taken their, they've looked at their allergens and they have, they have taken the, uh, the subject seriously. One of the challenges, particularly to, to, to answer uh, the example that you used specifically in the question with celery, is we can, celery is the one allergen that we cannot pick up by any method other than PCR DNA analysis. Yeah. Right. What it is about celery or celeriac, it just won't show up on a, on a protein, or a lateral flow, or an ELISA. So it's only done by DNA, which, give, which means you've got, yes, a very sensitive test, However, it's not necessarily representative of, of the other allergens that may be present. Um, when we do any clean validation trials, and we, we do this once a year with our, with our customer, um, actually based uh, over in, in Northern Ireland, um, we actually look at the, we've looked at the allergenic profile of, of all their products. We said, right, so in your allergens, in your, your mix, you have mustard, egg, celery, bizarrely enough, and um, milk. Right, so let's take your meat product. Let's, you, let's look at all the products that use those allergens, find the maximum level of each individual allergen that's present in your recipe, double it, and make up a mix. So we make up a mix with double the allergen level that you'd normally find of all the allergens plus the product, and we put that through their process. It smells blooming awful. It's a horrible mix. You wouldn't ever eat it. But we then clean the equipment. We then do the full range of tests once a year of ELISA, so lab-based tests, and the rapid lateral flows, and the non-specific protein tests, and the ATP tests, all at once, one exercise, validate the clean. And providing that the cleaning regime removes all of the allergens at double the level you'd normally find them, you then say, right, that clean, validated, good to go. As long as, as long as my operatives follow that clean and follow it every time, I'm reassured that the clean will work. But validating for one allergen on its own, you'd need to look more detail in more detail at the process. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I couldn't answer specifically for that, that particular customer and supplier. But if they've only validated for celery in a broccoli product using PCR, and you're concerned about removal of shrimp, then I'd, I'd, I'd be going back and, and having a, a bit more of a detailed look uh, at what they're doing and how they're doing it, what controls have they got in place, what's their general man allergen management policies, what training have they done, what awareness have, have staff got. It's not just a case of, right, we check for celery, we're good to go. You need to look at the, at the the whole picture, the whole diligence, awareness, and training side as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's really much a case by case um, um, approach to, to to whatever product or whatever um, raw material they're actually getting in, isn't that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Peter, I, I, we have no more questions. Um, we had a we had a, over ten questions there. Um, I'm conscious of the time as well. Um, 
uh, folks, it just behoves me to thank Peter uh, for a fantastic um, and very condensed and very practical um, uh, presentation on what to think about when controlling allergens in, in your, in your uh, food manufacturing and catering uh, facility. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I would point out to you that if you found this webinar useful, um, then I would like to bring to your attention uh, that we have two short and free, best things in life are free, workshops next week on practical allergen management for food businesses. Now we, have, we are running them on Monday the 17th for the catering sector and on Tuesday the 18th, that's next Tuesday, for food manufacturers. Uh, there are slight differences obviously in the approach taken uh, in, in both scenarios. Uh, the links uh, to both these uh, workshops have been put on the chat down at the bottom of your screens. Uh, and they're also available on the webs on our website, safefood.net forward slash events, if you want more detail. So if you or your staff or colleagues would like even a refresher course, for instance, in allergen management, then it's worth checking out uh, these workshops. And just to reiterate, <clears throat> Uh, we will shortly send out a link to a, a survey uh, to you via email and we would greatly appreciate uh, your feedback on today's event uh, you, through that survey. The recording of the webinar and Peter's white paper on allergen management uh, will be emailed to you in over the, ne over the next few days. Coming days, yeah. Yeah, thanks Trace. James, sorry, just to reiterate those workshops, the places are limited, so uh, if you are interested in attending, please okay. register as soon as possible because they're going very fast, which is great. So if you're not in, you can't win. Isn't that right, Trace? Correct. Okay. And as, as always, this webinar and a wealth of other resources dealing with food allergens and food hygiene in general are available to members of the Safe Food Knowledge Network, which is free to join at safefoodkn.ning.com. So I'll conclude there. Thank you all for yeah, joining today and goodbye. Thanks, Peter. Take care, Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.